welcome. I have one question for you to begin with, and that is, would you like me to do the presentation? Can you all tell where I'm from, from my accent? Yeah. From New York. So you have a choice. I can do the presentation New York style, which is a little edgy and sarcastic, or I can do it nice and polite Canadian. All right, New York, all right, you asked for it. All right. Now I'm going to test the interpreter, which is not a good idea because you can screw me if I test them too much. I'm gonna tell a joke. If you get the joke, you'll get what I'm talking about in terms of diabetes in the family, all right? So there are two guys talking with each other. One guy says to the other, you know I have a big problem. The other guy goes, what's your problem? He goes, well, my brother, he thinks he's a chicken. The other guy goes, your brother thinks he's a chicken. Today, that's not such a big problem. You take your brother who thinks he's a chicken and you take him to a doctor called a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist talks with him, gives him some pills, talk, pills, sends him home, tells him to come back in five weeks, more talk, more pills. In six months, your brother's cured. The other guy goes, you know, I'd love to do it, but I can't. He goes, what do you mean you can't? He goes, I can't, I need the eggs. <laughs> if you laughed at that joke, then you understand exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to parents and kids and families with diabetes. Because sometimes it's much easier to be the mother and father of a problem child than it is to be husband and wife and intimate with each other. And I don't mean sexually or physically, I mean emotionally. And when diabetes hits, it hits not only medically speaking in the body of your child, but it hits also on a, me on a metaphysical level, on a psychological and an emotional level, and it affects everybody in the family. That's what I'd like to talk about today. Now, the other question that I have for you is, um, <clears throat> so I am a diabetes nurse, and a family therapist, and uh, I work very closely with the Animus Corporation. And the thing about Animus that I really love working with them is, is that about 60 to 70% of the company has diabetes. And the other 40 to 30% are diabetes wannabes. <laughs> it's a very nice atmosphere to work in. And for me, I think the most healing piece of living with diabetes for me and I think it gets missed a lot in clinics, is the piece about the love and the, um, and the just helping people support them to break down and be themselves and sort of come to terms with this thing, and to helping the parents navigate the waters. Because the better the parents do, the better the children will do. I love working with kids. <clears throat> I've worked with them for my entire life. I've had type one diabetes. This year will be 53 years. Ask me if I like it. I need to hear everybody. I like it. No, I hate it. <laughs> and I love to say that I hate it. I'll talk a little bit more about that after I finish talking about some of the family stuff. But, um, but I hate having diabetes. I can promise you there's not one morning in the last 53 years that I woke up and said, Yippee, can't wait to take care of my diabetes today. Oh. Before breakfast, I get to check my blood sugar. Oh, how wonderful. And then I get to count the carbs. Oh, it doesn't get better than that. Then I get to eat the carbs that I've counted. Yes, oh, that's wonderful. And then maybe I get a little depressed because there's nothing left to do. No, after breakfast, I check again. Yes, I promise you that's not me. Um, and I think it's important to know that it's okay to say that you hate it and that you don't like it. There's not one part of this that, I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm happy to be alive. I am very grateful. And if God said to me, Joe, you know, when I come back from my next life, because I don't think I'm finished. <laughs> I think I got it in the diabetes department. I don't think I'll have to have another chronic illness. But I think I have some other areas that I need to work on, so I'll probably be back. So when God says to me, Joe, you can go down again for the show, but you have to have diabetes again, or you don't go down again at all, I would always choose to come down with diabetes. Meaning that I don't like having it, 
but I love being alive. There is nothing that I've wanted to do in my life that I haven't done. I've traveled around the world three times. I lived in the desert with the Bedouin for six months. Let me tell you something, when I first got diabetes, there were no blood sugar machines. Actually, the needles were three quarters of an inch. I can't see it. Anyway, they were big. <laughs> and you had to give the injection at an angle so that the needle would not hit the muscle. And there was no blood sugar checking. And the kids that I work with, they go, oh, I wish I had gotten it, but you got it. I hate the blood sugar testing. And I said, you know, you hate the blood sugar testing. There was no blood sugar testing. There was urine testing. You had to pee into a cup, take four drops of urine, stick it into a test tube of Benedict solution, and boil it for five minutes. <laughs> I said, you can't even get it together to remember to put your meter in your book bag, let alone put a Bunsen burner in a test tube. You know what a Bunsen burner is? Something to heat up the kettle. Okay, Mr. Translator, how are we doing? So, <clears throat> the bottom line is, is, from my perspective, you could take care of it if you wanted to back then, even when things were very primitive and you can take care of yourself now, even when things are very advanced and technological. The thing that hasn't changed since the Egyptians discovered diabetes is, is that people get diabetes, and that people living with diabetes are the one factor that will determine whether or not you do well or not. I think some of it has to do with luck as well. I'm not going to take all of the credit, but I feel like it's a lot of work. I have a resentment against the United States government. I think they should give me $150,000 a year just to stay home and manage my diabetes. <laughs> and I promise them that if they give me the $150,000, that I will not be a healthcare cost. And if anything comes down the road that I have to pay for, I'll pay for it out of my own pocket. You know? The bottom line is, is that like Dr. Abbas Alohe said this morning, it is a lot of work. And if you don't have it, I think a lot of people think you just take a shot and then you get on with your life. That, after overcoming that trauma, that's the easiest part. It's the rest of the day that have, how many of you have teenagers? How many of you have to remind them to check? Okay, good, we're gonna talk about that. How many of you have younger children? Okay, and how many of you who have younger children will have them become teenagers? <laughs> Perfect. So what we're going to do is we'll talk about teenagers. I'm happy to talk about other areas of life as well, but I wanna give you a sample of how this family approach works in terms of teenagers because if it works for in teenagers, then it can work for everybody else. You know, the thing about teenagers and diabetes is that I think they have two diseases, but thank God only one of them is chronic. <laughs> the adolescence goes away at about the age of 18 or 19, unless you're Jewish or Italian. <laughs> if you're Jewish or Italian, then maybe at the age of 45. You know? I remember going to, my mother passed away about seven years ago. But before she passed away, like about five or six years before, I went to visit her and my father at their home in Long Island. And um, as I was going to bed, my mother says to me, I was there by myself, and my mother says to me, Joey, she calls me Joey, Joey, you didn't have your snack. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what did the therapist say to say? What did the therapist say to say? Mom, that is so nice of you to remind me. I said, but you remember, and I wanted to become sarcastic and say, you know, I told you 400,000 times. I said, but remember I have an insulin pump and I don't need to have a snack before I go to bed. And she goes, oh yes, thank you for reminding me. Yes. And I said, oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Let me tell you something, change can happen if you go to therapy. <laughs> Things change, people change, I've been able to change. You know, That used to drive me nuts. But what I'm saying is, is that as a parent, you'll never not be the parent. 
you'll always be the parent no matter how old your kid is. Well, that's um, on the tails of that comment. The thing that I also think about diabetes is that I think it's difficult for those of us who live with it, but it's also very difficult, and I think even more difficult for the parents. And why do I say that? Because when your child first gets diagnosed, you become disabused of the delusion that you can protect your children from everything. Did everybody understand that? So you feel a sense of powerlessness because really your only job as a parent is to make sure that no harm comes to your child. So that when your child first gets diagnosed with diabetes, there's a sense that you have been a failure as a parent. And then if that's not enough in terms of powerlessness, the next step in the powerlessness is that despite your best efforts and intentions, you cannot take it from them. How many in this room, if they could, would take their child's diabetes? And mine, now that you know me a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to leave myself out of that train. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, no matter how much you want to, no matter how smart you are, no matter how, you can't take it away. Another experience of powerlessness. And my understanding experientially of this experience is that it takes a lot of coming to terms with. If your children have just been diagnosed, how many in the room have children that have just been diagnosed within the most recent year? All right, my heart goes out to you, and I will tell you this, that for about a year or two years, you're going to feel sad. There is no time schedule. Everybody comes to it on their own, but I promise you this, if you stick with it and do what you have to do every day, I promise you, that one day you'll wake up and the clouds will be gone and you'll be in your body again and you'll be sort of happy. I can promise you that. And I want to tell you that there's nothing that your kids can't do. If you are a family that works in carnival and you walk on glass as a family job, your children, if they have type 1 diabetes, can walk on glass, not a problem. They just have to take care of their diabetes. They have to manage it. But we can heal as quickly as anybody else. If they want to climb Mount Everest, they can. If they want to have children, they can. If they don't want to have children, you know, you don't have to have children just because you have diabetes. You don't have to have children, you know? <clears throat> and if you were miserable before diabetes, and I don't want you to, I don't want to take away your misery, you can be miserable afterwards. It's not, you know, the goal is to have your life. And my job as a diabetes nurse educator is to help my families, the ones that I work with and, and the people that I come into contact with, is to help them have their lives so that their lives after the diagnosis look as close to what their lives looked like before the diagnosis. That's what we owe you, is to give you all the tools that you need to do this. So I once had this idea to have a, a television series called Diabetes Survivor. I think it's a great idea, right? It's like you get like five or six people who have diabetes, you check their A1C before you drop them off in a helicopter in a swamp in Louisiana, and uh, you give them knives and guns and you know a wetsuit, and you give them the blood sugar checker and the insulin, and the, you make sure their pump is waterproof if you're sending them to the swamp. So it's kind of unanimous. Um, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And then you pick them up in three months, and there are two criteria for who wins. Number one, whoever has the best A1C, and number two, whoever's still alive. Okay? But it would be a great show, you know what I mean? I think, you know, for, anyway. If anybody is a producer in this audience, let's talk. So the thing that I think about is that I think it's tougher sometimes for the parents than it is for the kids. And that being said, taking care of yourself is, uh, is actually non-negotiable, no matter how old you are. So there are three rules for managing teenagers with diabetes. And if you take these rules, the, the parents, just raise your hands again if you are parents of younger children than teenagers. So I know what happens with you guys. You go to the support group meeting, and you're very happy because Jean-Claude's A1C is uh, 7.5 and he likes putting his numbers up on the board, 
you give him a little gold star and he loves his educator and all that kind of stuff. And then you come to the support group meetings where the parents of the teenagers are. And they're standing in the corner and they're looking for any parent that comes in smiling. <laughs> Which would be obviously the parents of the younger children, right? And they do like they do in the assassin movies, they put like a little red dot on your head. And then they come up to you and you think, oh, this is gonna be nice because um, this is a support group. And they come up and they say, how are you doing? You go, oh, fine, wonderful. Jean-Claude loves his educator and the doctor's so nice and he wears a funny tie and we love going to clinic and the nurses are so good and he loves doing his checks and he's learning to change his infusion set. And the parent of the teenager goes like this, well, you just wait. <laughs> That's what you get in a support group. <laughs> and I think, you know, to be fair to the parents of the teenagers, you know, I think they make everybody pull your hair, their hair out. You know what I mean? I happen to love working with them. The more crazy, the better. So let me talk to you a little bit about this family approach with um, teenagers, and then we can extrapolate to younger children as well. But at the end of the day, they did a study. I just want to sort of tell you this right up front. They did a study at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia about 32 years ago. They looked at 50 families at the time of diagnosis. They wanted to see what things about the families could give a clinician a tool to say, based on this thing, I can predict that the child's hemoglobin A1C will be in this zone a year or two after diagnosis. They looked at locus of control. They looked at self-esteem. They looked at quality of life for the family. They asked the family to do a plan a picnic together and score how they talk with each other and many other things. Out of all of those things and anything else that you can sort of think about, tell me what you think was the most statistically significant predictor. If I look at this one thing, I could fairly assuredly say what your child's hemoglobin A1C would be a year, a year and a half after diagnosis. What was that one thing? And if you tell me, I will give you five dollars. <laughs> American. <laughs> make some money on the, make some money on the deal. Yeah. Anybody know? Yeah? <laughs> Happiness. No, but that's a dollar. <laughs> More than least a dollar. Nobody ever says that. Oops. All right, I will give you right here. <laughs> Happiness is important, but it wasn't the one. Love is important, but it's not the one. Vacation? Communication? No. Self-esteem? No. You have lots of writing in the literature that says that kids who are really feel good about themselves are doing horribly. Right? Good results. No, this is before diabetes. Something about the family before diabetes. You want to know? <coughs> All right. It was the mother's subjective sense that she had of herself, of how supported she felt by the other family members as a wife, a woman, and a mother. Meaning that if the mother and the family felt supported by the other family members as a wife, a woman, and a mother, then that child would do well. Now this doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything to do with fathers. <laughs> because I see a lot of fathers here, and I have to say, now the, I don't want the mothers to get pissed off at me, all right? But I do want to say congratulations to the fathers for stepping up to the plate, because in the past, it always used to be that the mother's job is to take care of diabetes. But anyway, so the mother's subjective sense of how supported she felt was the main criteria. The second thing was what? Was the diabetes nurse educator's rating of how easy or difficult it was to schedule and keep whole family educational sessions at the initial diagnosis. That translates into the extent to which you and your family could accommodate to the diagnosis and do everything in your power to suit up and show up to the hospital would predict that your child's hemoglobin A1C would be good in a year, a year and a half from now. 
your ability to or your ability as a family to organize yourselves around the trauma how you do that will have everything to do with your child's metabolic control so those are two important things now let's go into that want to talk about teenagers a little bit all right let's talk about it. <coughs> So three rules in working with teenagers, all right? If you can follow these three rules, you'll never have a problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if I'm doing New York, I want you to do a little New York. All right, cool. Rule number one, taking care of yourself is non-negotiable. You, to ask a teenager how many blood sugars you would like to do is a stupid question. That's like, uh, well, anyway, we'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> you have to do at least four checks a day. At least four checks a day. I do between 10 to 15 a day. But at least four checks a day, you have to write the numbers down. The kids go, oh, Joe, you're such a dinosaur. I know your mother used to sharpen your needle on a whetstone. And but you know, my meter talks to my pump, and my pump talks to the stock exchange, and stock exchange talks to, well, I don't need to write it down. Dude, your pump and your meter don't have diabetes. You do. You have to write it down. Anybody in the room use GPS in your car? Satellite navigation? The interesting thing to me about satellite navigation is you always get to where you need to get to, but you don't know where you are. Same thing with diabetes and not writing the numbers down. If you want to make sure that your child will leave home successfully, and I know maybe some of you are planning already on buying an apartment next to their university, <laughs> but if you want them to leave home successfully, you'll get them to start writing their numbers down. Because when you write it down, you remember it. Just sticking it into the machine and letting it float into the software program is too passive. So they have to do at least four checks a day. They have to write the numbers down. And this is the most important thing. They have to bolus. Do you know what bolus means? They have to give their insulin before they eat. The kids go, oh, I forget. You know? I said, dude, let me get something straight. You have memorized 40,000 cell phone numbers of your closest friends but you forget to bolus. To me, that's not a hard drive problem. That is a priority issue. And it's our job as parents and educators to make sure that their number one priority is taking care of their diabetes. Absolutely number one. So rule number one is taking care of yourself is non-negotiable. At least four checks a day, write the numbers down and bolus before you eat. Rule number two. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. If you like it, you're nuts and you need medication. <laughs> I know that many parents have brought their children here today because they're hoping that their children, when they leave, will say to them this. Mom, Dad, I just want to thank you so much for taking me to another stupid diabetes conference. <laughs> and I want you to know that I had an existential metaphysical epiphany I realize that I've been flying by the seat of my pants regarding my diabetes management, and I've been reckless and selfish and not taking care of myself. And I want you to know that based on listening to some of the other children and some of the staff from the camp, and I feel much more inspired, and I will start taking better care of myself. How many parents are hoping that that's what the kids are gonna say? Come on, don't lie. I, I say to you, if that's what you're hoping for, smoke another bowl. Because that ain't going to happen, all right? So, <clears throat> what you want them to do is they don't have to be happy. How many of you pay taxes? Oh, yes, this is Quebec. Excuse me. I love the whole <laughs> How many of you pay taxes? All right, cool. How many of you have a party celebrating two weeks before you pay? This is something that you know. You, you don't send a note to Tax Canada that says, you know, I just want to know that I've been doing this for 15 years now. I've been 
and paying 40%. And you know what? It's a little hard. Well, I'd like to negotiate with you and start paying 10%. <laughs> How many of you do that? None of you, because you know, you'd, first of all, they'd send the, they put you in this insane asylum. It's crazy. You know that as an adult, there are some things in your life that you don't have to like and you have to do. That's the message that we want to give to the kids. And that's why I think some of their lives, their childhood has been taken from them a little bit. Because they have to become more adult in this awareness in order to manage it effectively. You don't have to like it, you just have to do it. If you like it, you're nuts and you need medication. There's not one blood sugar machine on the planet that doesn't give you the number unless you like it. You know what I mean? It's like the number comes up whether you like it or not. You don't have to like having diabetes for the machine to give you the result. All right, so you have to do it. And now the third rule, which is the most important rule, and that is, is that to reframe non-compliance and mismanagement as any other act of misbehavior. Meaning that if you can get your children to do their homework, and if you can get them to go to school and to clean their room from time to time, then you can get them to take care of their diabetes. So let's give an example. 16-year-old Susie, she has type 1 diabetes for seven years now. Her last five or four A1Cs are 12.2. And she's getting good grades in school. She has lots of friends. And her parents don't know what to do. They sent her to die. I love diabetes camp. I'm not saying that it's not a good thing. I went to diabetes camp. I was a counselor at diabetes camp. I enjoy talking with the kids and one arm around the shoulder and doing all the stuff. I went to the camp. I went to the Camp Gene Nelson in Canada two times last year. I went and on my birthday, I was in a horrible mood and the kids made a birthday card for me and then we hiked and I was carrying the medical thing with 20 kilos on my back and I fell in a big mud puddle. Camp is great. <laughs> right? But it doesn't get you to do better. It just makes you feel better. Why is it everybody, all the parents, when they pick their children up, would like to leave their, when they ask the director, is there another longer session from July to August? From to August to July, no? Because I think like many of you today, you enjoy the fact that there are competent kids taking care of your, di you know, your children with diabetes. I bet you there are some parents who are gonna try and sneak out <laughs> without taking their kids home with them. <laughs> Oh, that was a relief. We didn't have to manage it for the whole thing. Sweet. Anyway, so this is Susie. She has a brother, Timmy, 14 years old, and a mother and father. They come into my office, and I say, hi, how can I help you? And the mother says, we'd like you to tell Susie how important it is to take care of herself. Have you ever done that as a parent? You ask the educator. To, so we'll do it like this. Okay, cool. Hold on a second. <coughs> Susie, it's very important to take care of yourself. Was there anything else that you wanted me to help you with? <laughs> Most of the parents want the educators to do the dirty work. They're exhausted. They've had it up till here, you know? So Susie looks at me. She doesn't give me, you know, this is what she does. You know, she, uh, um, <clears throat> So I say to her that, and now I know that Susie's on my side a little bit. So I ask her this question. I say, Susie, what's the worst part about having diabetes? And you know how teenagers are when they want to make you feel good? She goes like this. Oh. She rolls her eyes and gives me a grunt. I say, okay, well, maybe I didn't ask her so nicely. You know, I'll ask her another question and see what happens. I say, did your parents tell you why you're coming here today? I ask that question because a lot of parents are afraid to tell their kids that they're bringing them to see me. They don't know how to get them there. I tell them, tie them up. Huh? No, no, no. Yeah, we're going for ice cream, right? <laughs> tie them up, put them in the trunk of the car, and then carry them up to my office and I'll help you untie them. You know, who's in charge, right? I said, did your parents tell you why you're coming here today? And Susie goes, oh. 
I say, okay, she's had her chance. Now, I talk to the parents and I say, you know, your daughter seems very intelligent in a lot of ways. She is getting A's in school and she has a nice sense of uh, aesthetique, you know, she dresses nicely and colors and clothes. And I'll tell you this, I, the two times when I asked her the question and she so rudely responded to me with her rolling of her eyes, I thought I detected a light of intelligence behind her pupils. <laughs> but in some ways, she's extremely dumb. And now you can feel the tension in the room, you know? And she goes, Susie goes from the room. You know, it's not nice to talk about people like that when they're in the room. <clears throat> and I say, Susie, it's not nice to be socially backward when somebody asks you a question. Here are the rules of my office. Somebody asks you a question, you don't have to answer it, but you have to respectfully look them in the eye and say that I would not like to answer that. The other thing is, is that we do not need you for the rest of the session. Thank you for bringing your parents. Because <laughs> I really believe that kids don't have problems, they have parents. <laughs> and they bring their parents in for counseling, that's all. So I said, we don't need you for the rest of the session. So you can stay or you can go. Oh, and the other thing I need to tell you is I am not here to be your friend. I don't need another friend. I don't think you need another friend. I'm here to make your life miserable and to help your parents make your life miserable. And I'm really here to support your parents in their effort to make your life miserable. Now, you can stay or you can go. What would you like to do? She goes, I'll stay. <laughs> okay, welcome, right? What's the worst part about having diabetes? And she goes, my mother. <laughs> She's always nagging me. I say, that's great. I thought you were gonna tell me that you had organic lesions on your brain that made it difficult for you to understand how important it was to check and to bolus before eating and to write your numbers down. Your mother is the problem. We will hire a contract killer <laughs> and ice her. And then in three months, your hemoglobin A1C, A1C from the time of her death should improve. And if your mother is anything like my mother was, she will happily die for you. <laughs> Susie goes, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> what Susie doesn't get is that she's talking with me at this point anyway. Right? I'm not that interested in talking with her. And when I said to her that she could leave, I really meant it. I really don't need her for the session. I'd like to talk with her and be there. But my goal is not to talk with her. My goal is to help the family help her do better. So. Um, <clears throat> I've asked her that question, and I say, okay, we're going to do it. She goes, ha, ha, ha. And then I say, do you date? She goes, yes. I said, what is time do you have to be home? She goes, well, if I'm with my boyfriend, I have to be home by 11.30. I said, okay, let's say that you go out for a date, and your boyfriend picks you up, blah, blah, blah. You go out to the movies and dinner. 11.30 comes, no Susie. 12.30, no Susie, no boyfriend. 1.30, you haven't called nothing. Your parents are crazy, they're going nuts. They're like standing on the front steps of the house and they call the police and blah, blah, blah. At 2.31, they see your boyfriend's car coming down the street. The problem is it's not driving a straight line. It's driving all crooked. And before it comes up to your house, it drives over the front lawn of your neighbors. It drives over some bushes. It knocks over some rubbish cans and then it comes all the way up the front lawn, it stops right in front of the steps, and you and your boyfriend kiss. <laughs> your mother and father are staring through the windscreen. You finally come up for air, you roll out of the car, but the problem is, is that you're so drunk that you can't find the ground, let alone the car door to close it. Your boyfriend can't wait, and he tells, tears ass out the other way. My question to you this, is this, sweetheart, how many more times in this century would that ever happen again? And she goes, never. And if it did, it would never happen again. And I say, what do you mean? She goes, I'd be dead. And then I say to her, and here's the leap, the 
between going to just talking with the child about, don't you think you should do this better? Don't you think you should feel better? Don't you think you're not, da, da, da. This is where it becomes systemic. And I say to her that until your parents can apply the same rules in diabetes misbehavior as they apply to dating misbehavior, you will never be able to take care of yourself. Why do we think that giving a teenager or a child a lecture or a sermon will get them by understanding? How many of you ever smoke cigarettes or still do? All right. How many of you know that it's going to give you lung cancer? Everybody raise the hand. Now, that knowledge doesn't do anything for you, does it? You just know it. You might feel a little uncomfortable when you light up, but you still do it. What I'm saying is, is that teenagers and kids are younger. They need our support and our guidance. And I would say like this, that they tend to misbehave in diabetes, I think is their way of saying I need help. The other thing that's sad about a child that's not taking care of themselves is, is that I think when they go to bed, they know what's going on. This is not about more knowledge will get them to do better. I think most of the kids that I have worked with, when they go to sleep, they say to themselves, I messed up today, but tomorrow I'll do better. And then tomorrow comes and they don't do better. And they eventually lose faith in themselves. What I'm saying is that we as parents have to get into the game and set the ground rules for what's okay and what's not okay and what happens. So the father says, Joe, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, well, what should we do? I say, you should punish her. Now the mother says, you know, Joe, we thought you were a nice guy, a little funny, we like your accent, but now we think you're a fascist pig. How can we punish her for having diabetes? I say, you're not. You're punishing or disciplining her for misbehaving. God or life gave her diabetes. You didn't give her the diabetes. What you're disciplining her around is that if she has diabetes, there are certain things that she needs to do. That's how you do it. And then the father says, well, what should we do to her? You know, how should we punish her? And I usually try not to answer that question. And I just say, listen, she's not my daughter. This is a discussion that you have to have with your wife. My job is to facilitate that discussion. I say, if she were my daughter, I think I would try something medieval like a rack where you stretch her, you know. <laughs> well, for every blood sugar not done, you know, 50 lashes. You know. <laughs> but she's not my, maybe one of those ankle parolee things, you know, with the taser attachment, you know. And every time she thought not to do her blood sugar, you would taser her, you know. But that's me if she were my child. Lucky she's not, you know. You, have, you guys have to figure that out, all right? And then, once a week, you go over the numbers. So you need to tell the child like this. Your mother and I have had a discussion, and we've decided that from now on, we expect you to do 28 blood sugars a week. We expect you to write the numbers down, and we expect you to take your insulin before you eat. For every time that you don't do a check, you lose 15 minutes of Facebook. For every time you do a check, but you don't write it down, you lose half an hour of cell phone. For every time that you forget the bolus, you lose a night out with your friends. Is that clear? That's not fair. Is that clear? That's how it's supposed to go, on that level. Why? Because you have to talk in a currency that has value. If you want to organize a trip to the amputation ward with all of your kids to show them how bad it is, with if you don't do it yourself, that's not going to work. What they need to do is feel something immediate. And they need to be able to, in order to make a responsible decision, be able to weigh the pros against the cons. If I do it, nothing happens. If I don't do it and I get caught, this happens. But maybe I could try and get away with it and see what happens, you know? So that's the way it goes. And then you meet once a week. Remember, Susie, I told you that I could get your mother off your back, but that it would make your life a little bit more difficult? Yeah. I said, your job is to keep a written record. You have to keep that written record in the place where your mother and father have access to. Do you pay the rent, sweetheart? No. Do you have an independent revenue stream for food and clothing? No. Then the bad news is, is that until you do, you'll have to follow the rules. But that's only if your parents can make the rules. 
and follow through on that. I don't think your parents are really going to be able to work together. I think you know how to make them feel sorry for you and this kind of stuff. So try and get away with as much stuff as you can. Susie's looking at me like I'm crazy. You know what I mean? Because usually the educator goes like this. You should take better care of yourself. You're so young. You're so attractive. You have so much to live for. You know, this kind of stuff. But when the educators do that, the kids go like this. <laughs> so there's no point in delivering that sermon. So I tell her, be as bad as you can. I don't think your parents are going to work together. Now listen, everybody knows what I'm doing at that point. The parents are smiling. The kids are smiling. Everybody knows. Parents, it's a challenge to the parents. And then you meet once a week and you go over the numbers. Right? Now with parents, what is the first question every parent of a kid with diabetes asks their kid when they come down for breakfast? Did you check? And every time the kids answer yes. <laughs> and every time the parents know that they're lying. And then every time the parents ask the child, what was the result? And the child says, 8.1. Because 8.1 is a number to get you out the door. <laughs> and the whole day is a horrible thing now about, oh, I hate this diabetes thing on all levels, right? So you meet once a week for five minutes, no lectures, no sermons. You go over the numbers. You go, oh, look, sweetheart, you didn't do four checks today. Hmm. You lose an hour of Facebook. No, 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 I did it. Here's the machine. Look, I did it, I did it. You say, oh, you did do it, but you forgot to write them down. You lose an hour and a half of cell phone. <laughs> she goes, I hate you. You're stupid. And I tell the kids, if they really want to push their parents over the edge, tell them that you didn't ask for this disease. I didn't ask for this disease. The parents go nuts. You know? Then the parents go like this. They say, sweetheart, you know, we're just doing this because we're your parents. And when you become a parent, you'll understand about, that is nuts. That's like asking your child permission to do a parent thing. You know what I mean? I tell the parents to say like this, sweetheart, it's clear that your father and I hate you. <laughs> And that we hated you before you were born. That's why we gave you the gene for diabetes. And not your brother Timmy. Because we knew he was going to be the angel and that you are the devil child. Now, let me ask you, who's having fun? That's how it's supposed to go. That's how it's supposed to go. And then she goes, I hate you. You're stupid. And I don't love you. <laughs> and then you say, like they say in California, thank you for sharing. Have a nice day. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. So that's basically it. Now, when it comes to younger kids, it's basically the same thing. You can't, there are some things that are non-negotiable. A parent asked me in one of the last sessions, what, um, she asked a question, what about my little three-year-old who won't let me give the sight in any other place? She kicks and screams and runs around the house. And it takes a long time to get her. Even though we try and warn her, da, 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 I said, listen, it should only take two minutes. You say to her, sweetheart, where would you like to switch sights? Your tummy or your butt? <laughs> OK, then you just grab the kids, sit on them, and do it. That's it. But you want to give them a choice first. But at the end of the day, you don't want to indulge that kind of behavior. Because if it takes two, more than two minutes, then the child is winning and you're not, and actually they lose. So what you want to realize is that some things are non-negotiable. Now, is this easy to do? No. Is it hard? Yes. Do you have to do it as a parent? Well, that's your choice. But I have seen the pa in the families where the parents do it, that, uh, does that say 25 more minutes? <laughs> what does it say? I can't see. 10? Oh, awesome. So, guys get it? Yeah. Any questions?
No question. Come on. Just give me one question. What's that? Yes, you can invite me for supper. I am happy to come for supper. Absolutely. My, here's my contact information. I put it on here specifically, so. No, 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 don't come to New York. I don't live there anymore. Come to San Francisco. That's much nicer. Here's my, where is it? Does anybody? No, no, it went away. What happened? Uh, do we know where it is? Can you, can you come up to us? Email address. Joe at, now his is hard, but it'll make sense once you write it. All one word. A mile in my shoes. Dot com. A mile in my shoes. In English, that's an expression that means that if you walk in my shoes, you'll know what I feel like, you know? So I'm writing a book for kids and parents with diabetes. It's called, it's coming out in October. It's called A Type 1 Diabetes Guide to the Universe. Yeah, it's going to be really awesome. And you should check that web, the, uh, it'll be a mile at my shoes.com. We're just putting the website together. But around starting in September or so, You'll be able to get information about that. But Joe at a mile in my shoes.com, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm a very bad typer. I type like this. So if you type me a message and leave me your phone number, I'll call you back. <laughs> and then we can schedule dinner. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Yeah. What would, here's, can I repeat the question? What would you do if your kid with diabetes is taking blood from a brother or a sister? I would do, I would say you're a genius and you're grounded. <laughs> Meaning, that, that's what I encourage and counsel kids to do. I tell them to take the blood sample and dilute it with water you know, different amounts of water to get different numbers all the time, you know? You don't want the same number. So what you want is your kid to try to be a scoundrel, right? And a juvenile delinquent. And your job is not to let them. And you say, sweetheart, that was brilliant. And your mother and I acknowledge and applaud how brilliant you are. And you have 15 minutes or half an hour of Facebook that you're not playing with this week. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no big discussions. You know, if you want, you can. I'm not against big discussions. What I'm against is talking and talking with no change. I think it's important to talk with your kids about their diabetes. But I don't think in every blood sugar, and I don't think every time you see them, you know, the kids are going like, hey, I am not coming to lunch. <laughs> I am not. I am not coming downstairs because every time I come downstairs, they ask me about my blood sugar. If I were some of your kids, I would take a ladder out the back window. <laughs> right? So what you want to do is quick and boom and effective and that's it. No big blah, 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 you know? But call me if you have any more specific things. But the important thing is to set it up ahead of time because that way you let your kids make a decision whether or not they want to be responsible or not. You can't just pull this out of your back pocket and say, ha ha, you'll lose Facebook. You have to do it in a way that says, your choice. If you do it, we congratulate you. Because at the end of the day, what you, do, what you want is for the kids to realize that they're doing it because they have to do it. Yes? Duh, stop, right. I think at around the age of 12, 13, you know what I mean? Yeah. What was the question? The, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what do I have for main course when I come for dinner? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the question was, the question was, at what age do you start this program? 
And I would say you start the program at about age 12, or at about the time when they start becoming obnoxious. <laughs> no. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yes, if they're good, then what you have to do is, great question, I say a lot about what if they're bad, and I don't think kids are bad, I mean, do you know what I mean, well, you know where we come from, but if they're good, then you congratulate them, or you buy them something, it's like a little RT, you know what RT is? Retail therapy. I think that's fair, you know what I mean? Let's go out and sort of, that something, that very special thing that you wanted, not as a steady diet, but you know, and this is the thing that I wanted to talk to you about, thanks for reminding me. It's okay to have a breakdown about every three months. You know, I used to wake up in the morning sometimes and I used to feel like, oh my God, do I, is today the day that my kidneys die? You know, this kind of thing. I was always worried and it was like, on that kind of day I would be depressed. So instead of it hitting me, I decided to start scheduling my diabetes depression days. So now I call my friends and I tell them, next Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., I will be depressed about having diabetes. And I want you to call me every hour to tell me how courageous and inspiring I am. And they go, but Joe, you're telling us to tell you that. I said, dude, if you want to stay on the A-list, call. Cool. And then the night before, I rent five tragically romantic DVDs. Lawrence of Arabia, Free Willy, whatever it is, that will make you cry, right? And two pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream fudge swirl and chocolate chip cookie dough. Then, in the morning, I call to work. This is the most difficult thing that I came to terms with that I'm most proud of. I call into work and I say, hello, I'm not coming in today, I'm having a bad diabetes day. I used to think that I could never say that. I used to think that I had to hold it in all the time. That if you thought I was doing good, then I was doing good. No, it's like, hello, I'm having a hard time. I live with this stupid disease 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To not break down, you'd have to be nuts, you know? So they said, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. I said, maybe not, it might be two days, we'll see. <laughs> My girlfriend comes in, she goes, oh, poor Joey, which finger would you like me to pull to your check? Oh, my pinky, yeah. Like that. Tuck, 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 tuck. All right, I cover myself, I correct myself, and I cover myself for half a pint. Because I have two pints, but I'm not sure how much I'm gonna eat. And I don't want to have to eat it if I, you know, don't want to. So, then I put the movie in. I play a stupid little game with the ice cream. I will tell you this, 100% of the time, I start with the chocolate chip cookie dough. But, I play a little game. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Now, I know how to play that game so that I end up on the chocolate chip cookie dough all the time. It's stupid, right? Yes. Does it work? Yes. I had no choice about getting diabetes, but I do have a choice about which ice cream I eat. <laughs> and that's it. And I'm happy about that. I'm laying the phone, I'm watching the movie. And then first phone call comes in. Hi, Joe, this is Susan and Bob. We're just calling to tell you how courageous and inspiring you are. I said, thank you for calling. I just started the movie. Call back and tell me that again in an hour. <laughs> and that's how it goes. Remember I said it's from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m.? It never lasts past 11.30, <laughs> because I'm bored. The worst thing you could say to me, as a person with diabetes, is you could say to me, well, you should be grateful that you're not in a wheelchair. You want me to strangle you? Say that, right? I think I have a right to complain. <laughs> that's all I'm asking for, and that's what this pity day is. And I think if you go the other way, then you get to where you thought you would get to by being self-righteous. Right? You'd be a little silly. Turn it upside down. Have some fun with this stupid thing. So that's it. So this is the only thing that I wanted to show you. And then, since it wasn't 25 minutes, it was only five minutes, and I'm probably a minute over, I just want to show you one thing that I think you should have your kids do at home as well. I have calculated that in my 53 years of diabetes, I've taken over 99,623 injections. Now this is what I really think is magic. No leaks. No leaks. That's magic. Yes, you can. Thank you very much.
pense que c'est le rêve de toute l'équipe qui euh, organise un événement où on parle du diabète, on finit ça en rien. Um, you're really one of a kind, Joe. Thank you so much. And uh, I will uh, traditionally say... As a true camper, we love you, Joe. Thank you very much. Un gros merci. Euh, je pense que ça me fait du bien quand même de prendre un petit peu à la légère euh, notre petit 